Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. SpaceX Starship is now in the final stages of launch preparations. Three Falcon 9s took to the skies in only four days. India enjoys more success with its lunar lander and newly launched Aditya L1 spacecraft. Crew 6 returned to Earth safely, Ariane 6 performed a hot fire test, and we learned that Ship 25 is now very unlikely to survive its flight. All of this and more, let's jump right in. Guys, launch is now right around the corner, and that's not an exaggeration. We are now seeing SpaceX conduct the final steps needed before Ship 25 and Booster 9 blast off on the second integrated flight test of Starship. For starters, we saw Ship 25 have its X logo and S25 decals applied to its nose cone, and as for Booster 9, well, that's still on the launch mount and it's never going to leave the pad again until it does so under its own power, as workers removed the booster guide pins last week, which are used to keep the booster steady during lifts, but are removed for launch. In addition to this, personnel were spotted working on the booster's flight termination system, which of course is new and improved from the one seen on Booster 7, since, you know, the rocket remained structurally sound for almost a whole minute after the flight termination system was detonated. At the same time, a truck carrying explosives arrived at the site, which are almost certainly going to be used for the flight termination system. Furthermore, the workspace ventilation hose was removed, indicating that there's now no more work to be done at the launch pad. The tank farm is still receiving some new additions though, such as the installation of a new cryo pump and four new subcoolers for the liquid oxygen systems. All of these will allow faster fueling of the Starship. The chopsticks also received some love last week. Workers were spotted adding this rail-like object to them. This was followed by a brief raising and subsequent lowering of the chopsticks. Last Monday's episode came hot off the heels of the mid-bay's demolition, and we've since seen SpaceX begin cleanup operations at the former mid-bay site, removing the mangled pile of metal. It didn't take long for the site to be completely clear, and expansion of the Star Factory building continued. We'll soon see it expand into the space left by the mid-bay and tents 1 and 2. Workers also continued working on the new Mega Bay. NASA Spaceflight's Sean Doherty caught the lifting of a new staircase into the building, and Lab Padre caught the arrival of a new girder for the building's bridge cranes. Starship Gazer managed to get crazy close to a super heavy work stand as well. It briefly parked up on the public highway before being moved to be placed at the Mega Bay's west wall. As for future super heavies, Booster 12's methane section was lifted in the Mega Bay before being stacked, bringing Booster 12 to full height. And with that, another Super Heavy is complete. Sans Raptors, of course, and Hot Staging Ring. SpaceX might hold off installing the Hot Staging Ring for any other Super Heavy until we see it hopefully succeed during its first real use with Booster 9 and Ship 25. Will Ship 25 survive? Well, I'd say that's almost a complete categorical no. And I don't think that SpaceX expect it to survive either. This wild speculation is based on these close-up photos taken by Starship Gazer. As you can see, a lot of the tiles are chipped and damaged, but instead of being replaced, they've been filled in with some kind of epoxy filler, which is probably not going to withstand re-entry. SpaceX have stated that their main goal of the second Starship flight test is to just reach orbit, and haven't stated any plans for ship recovery, so at this point they're just not prioritizing this. Or they want to see how well a ship with damage to some of its tiles will hold up. The ships are built from stainless steel after all, which itself has pretty high heat tolerances. I'd love to hear your own thoughts on this though in the comment section down below. And of course, if you are finding the video informative or otherwise enjoyable, then don't forget to drop a like down there as well. It really helps support what I do here. In a space of just four days, SpaceX pulled off three successful Falcon 9 launches last week. Beginning on the 1st of September, we saw the launch of Starlink Group 6-13 from Cape Canaveral Space Launch Complex 40, which carried 22 Starlink V2 mini satellites to low Earth orbit. The booster made a successful landing on the assured fall of Gravitas drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean, bringing a close to this booster's seventh overall flight. The next Falcon 9 launch we saw was on Saturday. This time it carried a payload for the United States Space Forces Space Development Agency. This was the Tranche Zero mission, 
consisting of two main payloads, the Transport Layer Tranche Zero and Tracking Layer Tranche Zero. According to the Space Development Agency, Tranche Zero will comprise of 28 satellites in total, 20 in the Transport Layer for military communications and data, and 8 in the Tracking Layer for missile tracking. The Falcon 9 lifted off from Space Launch Complex 4E at the Vandenberg Space Force Base in California, and following stage separation, the first stage booster landed on Landing Zone 4, completing its 13th landing in total. The final Falcon launch we saw last week took place earlier today and marked a bit of a change for SpaceX. They announced that they would now be exclusively broadcasting their launches on Twitter, or I guess X, no more YouTube broadcasts, which is a shame. I was really hoping to watch Starship on my TV, not my phone, but whatever. <laughs> this launch was Starlink Group 6-12, and we saw 21 Starlink V2 minis launched from Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy and delivered to Starlink Shell 6. The first stage successfully landed on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean, and this booster just hit double digits. This was its 10th landing overall. SpaceX's Dragon spacecraft saw some action last week as well. Up on the space station, NASA astronauts Stephen Bowen and Warren Hoburg, Roscosmos cosmonaut Andrei Fedyeyev, and United Arab Emirates astronaut Sultan Al Nayadi all boarded SpaceX's Crew 6 Endeavour Dragon spacecraft on Sunday, before the hatch was closed and the Dragon autonomously undocked from the Harmony module's forward docking adapter. After a roughly five hour long cruise and descent, the spacecraft splashed down off the coast of Florida in the early hours of today, bringing an end to SpaceX's sixth operational mission for NASA's commercial crew program. A short while later, the crew were successfully recovered by support boats, bringing a close to their 120 day long mission. In addition to the croup, the Dragon spacecraft also brought back some investigations that were conducted on the station. One of these was the Stem Cell XH Pathfinder experiment, which is designed to examine techniques for generating human hematopoietic stem cells in space. These particular stem cells play a crucial role in the formation of blood and immune cells and hold promising potential as a therapeutic option for patients grappling with blood-related diseases and cancers. The prospect of cultivating them in space carries the promise of producing a larger quantity of stem cells possessed with superior qualities for clinical applications, potentially leading to significantly improved patient outcomes. Ariane Group conducted a comprehensive test of the upper stage for their upcoming Ariane 6 launch vehicle last week. This took place on the 1st of September at the German Aerospace Center. The upper stage, along with its subsystems, including the Vinci reignitable engine and the auxiliary power unit, were put through their paces during this test, which simulated the upper stage's operation during Ariane 6's inaugural flight, involving over 11 minutes of Vinci engine operation, APU boosts, and propellant control. Ariane Group announced the hot fire test to be a success, which brings us one step closer to seeing Ariane 6 enter service. I'm going to talk about India now, which unfortunately means I need to obfuscate the footage in some way to avoid copyright strikes, so sorry about that. But we've been following the success of the ISRO's Chandrayaan-3 mission for the past few weeks, and last week we got this cool image of the Vikram lander itself on the surface of the moon, taken by its Pragyan rover. It didn't stay there for long though. On Sunday, the lander performed a hop test, which involved firing its engines, ascending to roughly 40 centimeters, and then landing approximately 40 centimeters away. Another win for India there. Chandrayaan-3 was, of course, competing with Russia's Luna 25 to be the first lander to survive touchdown at the moon's south pole. As we know, the latter failed to land successfully, and NASA has released the first images of the crash site, taken by their Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Back to more successes from India though, on Saturday a polar satellite launch vehicle in the XL configuration lifted off from the Satish Dhawan Space Center, carrying the Aditya L1 spacecraft to the L1 Sun Earth Lagrange point, the first Indian satellite to be launched to this location, where it'll study the solar atmosphere, solar magnetic storms and their impact on the environment around Earth. The final orbital launch we saw last week took place in China. We saw a Long March 2D carry three Yaogan 39 satellites from the Zichang Satellite Launch Center on the 31st of August. While China is pretty vague about the details of the Yaogan series of satellites, it is widely understood that they're used for military reconnaissance. Laon Aerospace was back in action last week. I performed a very ambitious mission to launch a large ring station with a lander and refueling tanks all the way out to Ilu in just one launch. 
we lived, laughed, and lagged. So if you haven't checked that out yet, then perhaps one of the cards on screen will take you there. The other video is also from my channel that YouTube thinks you'll like, so hopefully it's a, a good pick. And of course, I must draw attention to the names on the left. They're my kind Patreon and YouTube channel members, and it's their generous support that allows me to keep on making this content for all of you, but yes, that's it. 